Only 18% of households will have enough wealth to fully fund their pre-retirement spending in retirement. Is that something you should be concerned with? No, it's not. It's not. So let's dive into this a little bit. Uh, we're going to go over an article by my man David Blanchett, who writes uh, for Morningstar. And I've been following Blanchett for quite a while. but uh, and, and he's not using this as a scare tactic. He's not. Um, he's actually elaborating on this more. But I'm telling you, man, the headlines are going to scare you to say, oh, my goodness, only 18% are, have uh, adequate resources to fund retirement. It's just, it's just not. It's just this incorrect way to look at it. So. This is a right size and retirement from a defined contribution institutional investment association. Wow. What's your job, Josh? I am a, uh, the key editor for the defined contribution institutional investment association retirement research center. All right. Dateline September, 2020. I'm not going to read this whole thing. I, I I've read it a couple of times. Just it's, it's a lot of this research stuff that eh, it's okay. Um, it's okay. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. Um, exploring the retirement consumption gap in early retirement. Uh, the research described in this paper estimates the pervasiveness of underconsumption. Underconsumption, i.e. you're not spending enough. Specifically, this paper explores the retirement consumption gap and considers both the wealth available to fund retirement, defined as either financial assets such as taxable account or an IRA, guaranteed income such as Social Security, uh, retirement benefits, a pension, uh, before or after retirement. Considering that both the assets and pre-retirement spending provides a richer context around spending decisions during retirement. So I want to, can I highlight that? Yeah, I want to point this out. Considering both the assets and pre-retirement spending, I want that to sink into your head for a second. Pre-retirement spending as we're contemplating retirement. I just want you to have that anytime retirement planning comes to mind. And I'm not using my mic, by the way. So am I pounding the table like cruise ship at the UN? I got rid of the mic because apparently that wasn't, I was catching too much. Uh, anyway, so pre-retirement spending in the context of retirement planning, man, you've got to say, put your hands up, say, whoa, 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 whoa. What, why are we co-mingling those? Hold on just a second. All right, so pre, oh, by the way, if you're wondering about my hat, got this at the uh, rally for Kelly Leffler and David Perdue a, a week ago or two weeks ago, and Burgess Owens, uh, Ted Cruz are all out here, and the NRA, ILA, the Institute for Legislative Action, was giving away hats, and as a life member, I get to have a free hat, which is cool, and it's very, it draws your attention, the hunting orange. All right, so anyway. Pre-retirement spending provides a richer context around spending decisions in retirement. Hmm. Uh, the anal analysis uses data from the RAND Health and Retirement Study, uh, focused specifically on changes in spending during the first 10 years of retirement. So I want to show you something right here. Key findings. Only 18% of households in the data were estimated to have enough wealth to cover pre-retirement spending during retirement. 18% of households were estimated to have enough to cover pre-retirement spending during retirement. I hope you see where I'm going with this. We'll read, let's keep reading. I just, I cannot stress this enough how important this is to get, to capture what is happening here and why, I, I just hope you get this, if that makes sense. Remember, only 18% of households had enough wealth to cover pre-retirement spending in retirement. Do you see the problem there? We'll dive into a little bit deeper here in just a second. Uh, median real financial assets were 35. Oh, secondly, retirees tend to spend down financial assets, but at different levels. Median real financial assets were 35% lower 10 years following retirement, and 65% of households had fewer assets 10 years after retiring. Okay, that doesn't, I mean, I, I would hope you would have fewer assets. Households with the lowest initial funded ratios tend to spend down financial assets the most, relatively speaking, have the fewest assets initially. All right, I want to, um, spending decline in real terms of the first 10 years retirement for 75% of households. Spending declined in real terms over the first 10 years of retirement for 75% of households. Huh. Who said that? Well, me. Now, again, is the, are they spending less because their assets are going down? 
Or are they spending less because they're getting older? We don't know for sure. I think there's a little bit of both in there, frankly. But I, I find it interesting that people say, oh my goodness, their assets are going down. That means they're going to run out of money. No, I just, the, no one, I, no, no, no. That doesn't mean that. <laughs> Spending less goes down because their assets are going down? Maybe. There's some legitimacy that to that for sure. Spending less because they're also getting older, but they're also tapping their principles. Is that a bad thing? But I also want to point something else down. These are assets, financial assets. Uh, Blanchett noted the uh, this effect of spending uh, uh, consumption dropping as retired in 2014. Uh, it has important implications when forecasting retirement spending in a financial plan. Since most financial plans assume retiree spending increases annually with inflation uh, throughout retirement, although it does not empirically on average. Empirical means observed. You've been able to observe real data and your spending does not go up on average. It's, and again, why is different than uh, the stating that that is true. Spending does not increase with inflation in retirement. Um, that that is a fact uh, empirically data we factually can see that as happened will that factually happen to you I have no idea however as a fact in the retirement consumption community the research is uh, is just overwhelming with empirical evidence that shows retirement spending does not increase with inflation it does not now the question is why that's happening is different we got to take the there's a dichotomy this happens why? 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 Why does that happen? I don't know. But either way, that totally changes the mix of retirement planning when it comes to your spending is going to go up each and every year with inflation. There's no evidence to show that at all. Now, we can make evidence that your spending goes down because you run out of money, what, all these different things. But we've got to get rid of the idea that your spending goes up with inflation in retirement because there's no evidence to show that whatsoever. Um. All right, finally, a percentage of households that can fund their retirement consumption have a funded ratio of one or greater increases dramatically during the first 10 years of retirement from 18 to 48 percent. I but that oh. all right, so let's talk. Um, all right, uh, the, the, importantly, this shift is largely a result of reductions in spending, uh, especially among households with the lowest initial funded rate. So, are you here? Oh, let me just read this and we'll come back to this. All right, uh, and suggests that households, at least in the early retirement, attempt to right-size their spending to better align with available resources as they come to the reality of expensive retirement. There's so much to unpack here. The percentage of households that can fund their retirement consumption increases dramatically during the first 10 years of retirement from 18 to 48%. And remember, what is 18? Only 18% of households with the data were estimated to have enough wealth to cover their pre-retirement spending, their retirement. So as we go into retirement, the percentage that has a fully funded retirement goes from 18 to 48%. What is happening here? Well, the reality of spending as people retire says, what I was using before as my retirement plan, my 80% rule, whatever the hell that is, 80% of pre-retirement consumption, that that just throw that out because it's completely fanciful. There's no there's no evidence of that whatsoever. So not only is there no evidence of your spending going up with inflation each and in every year, there's no evidence of a pre-retirement consumption number. The eighty percent you need eighty percent of your pre-retirement income. But why? Why? Why is it? Well, that's just what everyone says. Well, everyone's wrong, or even worse, uh, cover pre-retirement spending. Pre-retirement spending and retirement spending, two completely different things. To say I, I have $100,000 of pre-retirement spending, thus I need $100,000 in post-retirement spending is just as stupid. It makes no sense. It makes no sense. There's no justification for that. Again, maybe that is for you specifically when you look at your numbers post-retirement, pre-retirement. But to say that is, uh, we only have 18% are ready for retirement, but it's just dumb. And then we can see more evidence right here. Your funded ratio, how much you have to fund retirement, jumps by 250% after you actually have a few years of retirement because then we get a gauge of what your real expenses are. Ugh. Perhaps the most interesting thing, a group of households in this analysis, of those who have more than enough wealth to cover pre-retirement spending, I don't even care. All right, so I want to show you something here. Um, the other thing I just want to point out right here. All right, all right. So there's so much going on here. It's just, oh. all right. We're using models. Oh, I'm going to show you something right here. Uh, hold on. We're using data from, oh, let me see if I can't find, yeah, right here. 
1999. So we're using the life cycle hist hypothesis from Magla Gelini, or whatever his name was, uh, the Italian guy who actually I liked, and he won a Nobel Prize. I read a lot about him when I was in economics in the, in the early 90s. 1954, life cycle hypothesis. <sighs> implies that both individuals both plan their savings consumption to smooth out their consumption of their lifetime, thereby maximizing their expected lifetime utility. That may or may not be true. I, it, but I mean, my goodness, this is from 1954. Here, 1999, that's 21 years ago. Stein in 1999 exhibits a go-go, slow-go, no-go phase of retirement. I, look, that might be true too, but with the data that we're using here, and that, that's just you know people's articles that they're observing. And I, I got no qualm with that. But what I don't like, it's stuff right here. 1992, 2005, and 1998, the idea of retirement consumption gap seems slightly at odds with the general picture of retirement readiness retirement in America, where research has generally noted most U.S. households are poorly positioned to fund retirement. Uh, 1992, we're still using that from 30 years ago? 2005, from 15, 1998? How can retirees have undersaved and then not spend what little money is It's just... This is old data. Now, it might be right or right. I don't know. But my goodness, man, this is what drives you crazy with academic papers. This is actually when I always come. Uh, oops, got to put it on right there. It's a little bit. Well, I always challenge people when they're looking at the uh, Institute of Medicine study that uh, shows the veracity of vaccines on uh, children. You know, we say, look, they're using studies from 1992, 1994, 2000 and stuff. And it's completely the, the number of vaccines to given to children nowadays is not is no longer what was in the, the modes in 1992, 1994 and 2000. It's expanded. It's, I mean, compounding, actually, or exponential is nuts. And so to use this old data set to validate something today, you just can't do that unless you're absolutely stating explicitly. This is what the old data said, but it has not that much effectiveness today because today things are different, especially when it comes to the vaccines where we got, to, you know, freaking 19 doses of various vaccines and the old data did not recognize that at all. So the same thing happens here. Look, I some of this old data, we have more studies now. You see what I'm saying? The data is forever changing. So to refer back to 1998, 1994, kind of like the 4% rule, I don't like it. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying don't let that give you uh, your reasoning as to retire or not to retire. It doesn't make sense. But I want to point something out to you. Uh, uh, Ban Banerjee, Banerjee, who I follow actually on LinkedIn, a big fan, notes that while most retirees do spend down their assets in the first 18 years following retirement, about one-third of all sample retirees had increased their assets over that period of time. So one third of retirees actually increased their assets. They didn't overconsume. Most retirees had spent down their assets. Spending down assets, who cares? It is not necessarily clear why some households seem averse to accessing, uh, accessing savings to fund consumptions. Society of Actuaries in 2010 interviewed retirees and concluded that respondents wanted to maintain or increase asset levels. And this was primarily accomplished through cuts in spending. Well, housing, now check this out. Well, housing isn't an asset, is an asset that could be used to fund retirement. Retirees have very little interest in accessing it, according to a study in 2011, 2006, and then to, uh, 2010 Society of Actuaries conducted a study that said only 11% of retired respondents noted, indicated they were planning to use home equity to finance their retirement. All right, so that I just I found that to be interesting. So only eleven percent were going to use what most people is their biggest asset, their home, to finance retirement. On top of that, we have eighteen uh, percent are telling us the the academics are saying that they're underfunded for pre-retirement spending, which is completely it's a not it's a it's it's a nothing burger. So you got this huge asset in housing, all right, that no one's using. You got this huge. Uh, gap. Only 18% have enough money to cover pre-retirement spending. No wonder why everyone's thinking there's a retirement crisis. Yet, and then you see, and then you have also these people stating over and over and over again, your income needs will increase with inflation as you get old. There's just no evidence of that whatsoever. And then finally, though, you actually do the studies and most retirees are quite content. That's just a fact. Most retirees are quite content. And I, I just the whole thing is, you know, we're, I don't even know what it is, man. It's like a, you know, we're, we're dealing with so many misconceptions. No wonder why I went stressed out financially. And I just wish they would not. You know, does that mean you will not be that person who runs out of money? No, I don't know. 
That's why you got to make a plan, man. You got to look at your expenditures. But we know for a fact, as people spend to their level of income, and when their income declines as a salary, their consumption declines. It's because they no longer have a guaranteed source of income. That doesn't mean they're good, bad, or other. It means a lot of times they're spending inefficiently. I know I do. Well, I made a lot of money in 2020. I spent a lot of money on stuff I probably would not have if I didn't make a lot of money. I know that for a fact. It's just the way it works, man. You got money coming in, you're spending it in a less efficient manner. The money starts getting tight, you spend it in a more efficient manner. It's just it's the nature of the beast. It's a consumption model. And then when you have no salary, we know for a fact, there's empirical evidence there as well. When your guaranteed income drops and now you're pulling money from a portfolio that's volatile, you're going to reduce, you're going to tighten your belt. It's just that simple. And there is something called the wealth effect, by the way, which is very meaningful. The wealth effect says once you have more money through stocks and equities, you, you, can, you tend to spend more just because you have a feeling of more wealth. Once that wealth effect declines because of stock market decline and things of that nature, you spend less. You're still getting by and you're still content. You're just spending less on inefficient uh, consumption. Anyway, hope that makes sense. I, I'll, I'll put this link in the show notes if you want. I, uh, I, it's just, again, it's another pet peeve of mine. Lastly, Blanchett, I don't know if he deals with clients, actually. That's my another concern of mine. I was listening to, uh, who was it? Uh, somebody, I forgot, I was, I was emailing somebody back and forth. And I could tell the guy wasn't working with clients. And I said, he, or he, I forgot, I mean, he's young and not working with clients. So look, I get it, you're a researcher. I get it. Uh, but if you're not working with clients, you actually don't see what's happening in the reality. You're just seeing the data set. And lastly, when it comes to things like BLS, uh, Consumer Expenditure Survey, and even the HRS, uh, Health and Retirement St Study and whatnot, um, that's a data set that's being observed, i.e. people are actually filling out a sheet, sending it back to the BLS, Bureau of Labor Statistics and things. That's not quite the same as people who aren't keeping track of their consumption. And so you just got to weigh all this with the, uh, the how the level of observation is coming from a data perspective. Say, well... Is that truly true? Or are people saying, look, I'm going to, I don't know, they might have, they might have, uh, oh yeah, let me get this guy. I forgot about that. They might have some level of consumption that knowing that they're being viewed, uh, they're not going to do it, if that makes sense. But if they don't, if they're not viewed and, and being mandated, they will do it. I don't know. They might uh, buy, you know, buy cigarettes. But as long as uh, they know the BLS is looking at them and they're saying, well, I'm not going to I'm not going to put cigarettes as my consumption, if that makes sense. Anyway, hope this makes sense. Uh, love to hear your comments. We'll see you.